Hello. Hi. Welcome to the podcast. On this episode, we're talking to two new friends of ours, Ken Cameron and Russell Stratton. So Ken is the founder of Corporate Culture Shift and Russell of Blue Gem Learning. And together they wrote a book called I Need to Effing Talk to You, which has a whole ecosystem around it. And basically what this conversation was about was about how you can implement form theater to then into your train in your corporate trainings to actually give people actual experience of the situation that you know a lot of people tend to avoid right so live simulations with real actors that play disgruntled employees or a disgruntled consumer or something like that to give your your employees an actual opportunity to go out and actually learn something and learn new techniques and forum theater allows the group and the 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 crowd to then implement new suggestions and then they switch up and it's a lot of fun and yeah right exactly and it proves that training can be fun. So this is a fantastic conversation. If you're watching this on YouTube, it's coming right up. Or if you want to listen to it, it's on a whole bunch of different platforms. You can definitely do that. Uh, either way, enjoy the show. Enjoy. Well, great. Well, we're in conversation with Ken Cameron and Russell Stratton. Um, guys, we usually get started with you giving us a little information about who you are and what you do. Oh, well, I'd be happy to do that. This is Russell Stratton. He's a learning champion with Blue Gem Learning. Uh, he's originally born in London in the UK and emigrated to Canada about 10 years ago where I had the opportunity to meet up with him. Russell uh, has an MBA in business management and he is uh, um, uh, also, as, uh, as, he, as he describes himself, a learning champion. So Russell, your turn to introduce me and let's see how well we do with each other. <laughs> I like uh, those. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. So, hi. Um, this is Ken Cameron. Uh, Ken was originally a, a theatre director and playwright, one of Canada's uh, leading lights in that area, um, but has transitioned his career from um, the theatre into the business world, is uh, often called by his um, clients a facilitator for thinking differently. So Ken likes to get his um, clients to think outside the box in terms of solving complex problems and brings uh, to those conversations his experience of the arts world using arts as a way of a metaphor into the business world. So that's really what Ken's all about, and I've had the pleasure of working with him on a number of projects over the last five to six years. Jesus, Excellent. Russell, that's way better than my introduction of you. Like, I, I really got to step up my game here. Okay, then, then I really want to add to to my introduction of Russell that one of the things that Russell really focuses on that I really admire about Russell and which drew me to collaborate with him was his focus on experiential learning. Because one of the things I really liked about the way that Russell trains and that we, we really gravitated to at the very beginning was that it's not just about sitting in a room with a book with one person at the front lecturing at you and you write everything down in the book, and then you take the binder back to your office, you put it on the shelf, and then you probably forget all about it. And when I first met Russell, one of the things that he was doing was equine-assisted learning, where he was using horses to help uh, do, uh, in effect, execute leadership training. And so when I saw that and experienced that, I thought, well, this is something that this is somebody who I really want to start collaborating with. And so I really come to admire that about Russell's way of approaching learning. That's yeah. good. In fact, in fact, that story for when we very first met at a networking event, it was about eight o'clock in the morning, downtown Calgary. We were just over pastries and coffee, and a mutual connection of ours said, "Oh, uh, Russell, I'd like you to meet Ken. Ken does some sort of sort of interesting things with theatre." And he said, "Oh, and Ken, here's Russell. He's doing something with horses. You two yeah. need to talk." <laughs> I think it was actually, I think it was actually, and okay, you both do weird things. Weird was, things, that was it. You both do weird <laughs> things. He does something with theatre and actors, and you're doing something with horses, which could have opened up a whole raft yeah, of possibilities oh as to God. what that was. But, uh, oh, you know, uh, we seem to get from there to where we are now. So uh, it obviously worked that. out all right in the end, yeah. I love that. It's like, uh, you guys both do weird things. Uh, yeah, and, and hopefully it was, Russell does weird things with horses. Yeah, like Russell, yeah, and then yeah. I was like, what, what, what weird it's things it, are you doing with horses? Instead, you should do weird things together. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I for this, right? I'm like, oh, okay. So I, I, I game. I, I wasn't sure whether what she was doing was like, hey, you guys sort of should should work together or just like, these are two weird guys. I need to get them away from me. Let's go and put them together in the corner. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll go with the former. I think that, 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 that sounds yeah. a lot better. 
Yeah, before we dive into it, we have a story too about a, a, a in a networking event where well, that's the joke is that he puts people together oh, yeah, yeah, right, that right. don't that he doesn't want to talk to anymore, right? And just like, hey, you, uh, mm-hmm. you do. You it's like we, so. It's like a whole joke uh, yeah. uh, with a networking event that we frequent. Um, but that's that's hilarious. You two and, meet. T- tell us yeah. how, how did you two meet? Well, oh, uh, no. one day my mom just brought him home. That's yeah. essentially how that happened. Yeah. He just well, he just day, showed up I, one day and. Yeah. That first I have, day I couldn't stand him, and then after that we were I didn't have much close. of a choice in the matter. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure someone probably said, you you do weird things, and he does weird things. Or I'm just weird. Yeah, there you go. That's it. So uh, someone somewhere said we should put these two together. So we have very, very similar origin stories. There yeah, you go. Right, right exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, right, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah so... The experiment, uh, experiential learning, right, and and that's and that's where you guys are focused on. And and the weird things with horses was about leadership training. Just in case anybody wants to take that clip out of context, <laughs> I'm pretty sure Russell is only doing weird things with horses in that way, right? And then Ken with the with the actors and and the and the and the play backgrounds and everything. And so that's what really piqued my interest when I when I met Ken and we got I got to meet Ken through Matt Elwell um, during playdates. So another shout out to Matt Elwell. Um, if you guys haven't checked out his at the playdates networking events, you definitely should. Um, just was on one yesterday, and uh, and you know it's always a lot of fun. We get to play games. It's very improv um, You know, a, a sort of uh, networking event. You can really build really good relationships there. Um, but Ken, when you were talking about what what you guys are doing, and I got the pleasure we got the pleasure to meet Russell just a little while ago. Um, you know, it's it's amazing. Like you said, with a lot of these trainings that corporations go through where it's very much a guy in the front of the room speaking about a subject that's very important, sexual harassment, uh, way to conduct yourself in the business, uh, you know, uh, you know, a uh, way to handle disgruntled customers and all this other stuff um, and how that that really like I, I was just thinking about my time back at FedEx, um, you know, they just do these modules. You just sit down in front of a computer screen. You're totally by yourself. And somebody would just be like, um, this is how you act when somebody's like this. Try this. Try that. And you're like, well, that's not how learning works. You can go to a kindergarten and understand that that's not how learning works. Right. You have to really be engrossed. And so if we got to just give a little bit of information more about like what what that typically looks like and we can really start to dive in to the work that you guys do with corporations to get those tough subjects and actually get real results from it well the central to the program that we run called i need to effing talk to you is the use of live actors in order to play or role play the the person that you need to have this difficult and challenging conversation with so a lot of our work centers around the experiential learning in that sense. And we, we have adapted a form called forum theater, sometimes mm-hmm. called theater of the oppressed. And it was invented in Brazil in the 1960s. And if you cast your mind way back in time to the age of hippies and of uh, you know the the movements that were traveling across the world where they really thought they would transform the world through through new ways of thinking there was this wannabe hippie who had he'd gone to engineering school but he only went because his father told him to his real love was theater so as soon as he graduated from engineering he started a little theater company and he started traveling around the poorer parts of brazil trying to change the world trying to activate the communities to get them to rise up against their oppressive landlords and maybe form a tenants coalition and start, and he would go from community center to community center and uh, around the the poorer villages and maybe into the other cities around brazil and he would come back the next year just as enthusiastic and you would discover that nothing had changed. They hadn't done anything. So he'd do his little plays again. Maybe this time it was a new play, slightly revised and tweaked it a little bit. And he'd, again, he'd come back the third year. Nothing had changed. And he got really frustrated. And he said, well, you know, I stopped and stormed on stage in the middle of the play, stopped the action and said, what's wrong with you people? Well, what should happen in this, in this little scenario here? We've got this mother and she's about to be evicted by the landlord and she's got her son who's in the gang and she's got her husband who isn't working. You know, what should she do? Crickets, silence mm. from the audience. And because they were you know, used to this one-way flow of information and were used to responding to what was going on on stage. So he said again, what should she do? Like, like you know, what should happen in this scene? Again, crickets, nothing. And then he says one more time, a third time, what should she do? And voice from the back of the room says, well, she should speak up. And the, 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 this director 
uh, stormed off of the stage. And, and if, who said that? Who said that? And he grabbed it. It was the cleaning lady. I mean, she'd been there as often as he was, like three years in a row, and she was sick and tired of the damn play. Mm. So she, so he grabs her on stage, and he kicks the actress playing the mother off, and he says, you do it. And he sits her down at the, at the table, and he says, you, you show us what should happen. And so this cleaning lady just goes to town, and she like kicks the landlord out of the, out of the uh, uh, apartment, and I imagine that she turns to the... Uh, to the um to the to the direct to, to the husband and says you get a job and turns to the son and says get out of that gang go go to school or what mm. you know and then gathers the other and then before you know it Augusto is pulling other people out of the audience and um uh, getting them to play the other tenants and she's forming this tenant coalition uh, all of this because he had turned the spectator into the actor. Mm-hmm. And this, and then from that point on, he realized that this was the kind of theater that I wanted to create. The gentleman's name was Augusto Boal. The form of theater that he created, he called theater of the oppressed. But in North America, we tend to refer to it by the less socialist name, forum theater. And mm-hmm. the idea is that we will, you, you will bring, you'll kind of create a scenario which reaches a crisis point. And at that point, you call time out and you ask the audience to come up and you turn the spectators into spect actors. And yeah. they become the ones who start to start to in, start to change the action. And then when they yeah. get stuck, you call a timeout. They get to ask advice from the forum, right, the rest of the audience. And you get to move the action forward and intervene in that sense. And the learning sticks and they can go back into their world and they can begin to change their environment. Yeah. And um, so when Russell and I met at that breakfast meeting, Russell, why don't you pick up the story from there? Yeah, so so one of the things I I had a little bit of work in this area back in the in the UK. So I'd say to Ken, oh, do you happen to know about Forum Theatre? I never worked with it, and he had. So I, uh, we then went for coffee, and it really I sort of explained how I envisioned us using it, um, and then Ken brought his sort of ideas of of you know from the uh, theatre world of how this would actually work and who the actors could be, and uh, we, we we tried it out. And our initial focus was around. Um, supervisor or manager and employee how do you have those difficult workplace conversations around a a perform poor performance poor attendance minor disciplinary issues and the whole ethos was that often people know they need to deal with a situation but they're reluctant to deal with it often because they're either uh, they lack the tools or all they ever had before was they went through the online learning that said, in this situation, you should do as you outlined earlier on. Yeah, right. But they've never actually had to do it until it's the real thing. Um, and so my background was I, I, I'd worked in um, law enforcement around um, the UK Customs Service, a bit of time on secondment to Scotland Yard, as Ken likes to, to say, uh, the Metropolitan Police in London. I <laughs> uh, worked with emergency services, worked with, in the defence industry with ex-military contractors. The reason I say this is a lot of their, their training is simulation-based. You know, yes, there's some classroom, you know, let's go through the model, but then it's actually let's go and do it. Let's yeah. practice what to do in crowd control. Let's what practice what to do... If you come across a road traffic accident, let's practice what to do if you come across a hostage situation. And they practice it and practice it and practice it until it becomes second nature to them. And I thought what was interesting in the corporate world is when we got to those, you know, maybe not as quite high stress situations, but they can be for people fairly stressful. You're going to have to have a conversation with somebody. It's going to be difficult. They may not agree with you. There may be some emotion shown. We don't really set people up for success. We give them the booklet that tells them what to do and then expect they go off and do it. So what we wanted to do in the conversation with Ken is, okay, how can we use something like Forum Theatre where you've got the support of a group of people in the room, but when you're in the hot seat, so to speak, you're being you and you're able to feel how it is to deal with that situation. And that's one of the feedback that we've had from numerous participants that they say, you know, even in front of a room of 200 people, when I was sitting there opposite the actor and we were going through that particular scenario, it was as if everybody had melted away. It was just the two of us and it felt to them pretty much the same as it did um, in the workplace. You know, yeah. the same emotions, and I get very nervous in that, and they felt that. So we were helping them. How do you deal with your nerves? How do you phrase that differently so you get a better result? And yeah. The, you know, that, that was the – it was the, the you know, the people were in the moment. I think that was the, that was the key thing with it, rather than just it was this, uh, you know, separate something that was being shown on a screen. You were actually – you were doing it. 
in the here and now. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a forum theater. So I didn't have a word for it, but now I do. Um, and and you know that's when when I when I first talked to Ken, it was about you know the first thing that I kind of um, attributed it to, or, or to make some sort of connection to my mind was when they use actors in um, medical school, right? And they have them come in and they exhibit these symptoms and everything. And you know we're filmmakers and we've worked with actors, um, and we've worked with some actors that are a hundred percent method actors. Like they go in and they do not break character. Throughout the entire shoot, if the shoot's an entire weekend, you don't get the real guy until after everything's like done, done. Um, and just to go back to what you said, Russell, about the nerves that you get, right? Because, and and this just goes back to like, rather than having two employees act this out, you have somebody that, well, number one, you don't know. But number two, you guys know they're not breaking. They're not going to break. They're going to push, Right. They're going to act exactly in the situation that you guys have laid out um, and make sure that they're getting the most authentic or, or the best results from the employee. And as you know, to your point, the forum, the rest of the people that can come in and, you know, in, in essence, tag in or give suggestions as to like what the next move is so that they don't get. Um, you, so when you feel stuck, at least then, you know, like, okay, well, I have these other options that I can go ahead and do it. So it's an absolutely, it's a really, really fun and amazing way to get real results out of stressful situations. And hopefully, like you said, get people to not, you know, you alluded to it, not get people to avoid the situation, but to actually go and just tackle it head on because they had the actual, a pretty realistic simulated experience. Yeah. And, yes. You know, no, I was just going to add that um, you know the because those actors don't break character as as you say the um, but when we call time out then the the action is able to stop the actor is able to kind of um, uh, hold like you know, they can relax and they'll sit back but when we swap out a new participant like we'll often say oh that's a great idea thanks for suggesting that why don't you come up and you try it. So then we'll put a new person in the hot seat. And when we resume the action, then the actor is able to pick it up right from where we left off. Yeah. So from the audience's point of view, it's kind of like one continuous conversation with three different versions of the manager in that place until you get until finally they land on something that actually works. Yeah. And we've built the scenario in such a way that the actor has kind of multiple layers for them to play with. So if the first person starts, they usually will solve a problem and they'll they'll kind of get through the first little layer of the onion and they think, OK, well, I've gotten it. But then the actor will give them another problem or another, another question or another issue. And they'll have yeah. to dig through that. They'll get another they'll get stumped again. They'll call time out. We'll bring in the second participant and the w our actors are uh, trained one of our one of the ways in which we structure things is that when the second person comes up whatever they try actually works they they succeed but mm -hmm. and the actor gives them that 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 win um, yeah. and but then there's another problem there's a second and the actor is then trained to provide them with the second obstacle so then they right. now they're stuck so they call a timeout we get a third person participant to come up and they take that seat and whatever they try usually works Right. Now, I say usually because our actors are also trained to uh, be in the situation as if it's a real scenario. So right. if the participant comes up and they try something like really lame, well, then, of course, <laughs> it doesn't work. Right. Right. And we've also encountered those situations where the first participant who comes up just nails it. And the mm -hmm. actor like has to like stop and be like, ah, uh, OK, well, I know that I'm supposed to put another obstacle here. But then the actor will in those situations, we often invite the actor to explain to the forums like I tried. I tried. Mm -hmm. But everything I tried, like yeah. the participant was so good, they were able to parry every objection I had. And I eventually I had nowhere to go but to agree. Right. And so in, in that sense, it really is as close to real life as possible without having the real people in the room with you with the added benefit that you can press time out and call for help, which right. you never actually can do in the real world. And, right. the, and the other thing I say that these the, the, the people find useful is one, that opportunity that it's, you know, you can come and try it for your, you know, spot three, four, five minutes or something. You're in the in the real. Then you can come out and scan to the other people so you can watch what they do. And you might think, well, that's great. I'd never thought of it putting it like that. Mm -hmm. And and the third thing I think is useful is 
that we can stop the action and as well as input from Ken and I and from the forum is the actor can give the participants feedback in both in and out of character. So they can mm. give them feedback in character. Well, what was it about what was just said that caused you to react in that way? And they can say, well, because of this, of this, of this. And it gives people a bit of an insight of peeling away the curtain of why people might be reacting in particular ways to particular comments or uh, approaches that they wouldn't necessarily get in, in real life. Because if you stop there and say, well, why did you react in that way? Then we get into a whole other potentially confrontation. What do you mean I was reacting in that way? I wasn't, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's useful with, with no judgment in there just to be able to get some feedback from the actor in character that the person go, okay, I hadn't realized that that phrase or that way of a, perhaps if I'd done it this way, can I try it again? And of course, as, as Ken said, yeah, we can rewind. The actor can play it as if nothing's happened. Person can try it again, phrasing it a different way. We've even done it where people have done it two or three different ways to find which is the most effective for them. So mm-hmm. it's a flexible tool as well as being uh, you know, a highly um, impactful one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Jeff? No, what I was going to say kind of got talked about, so. Oh, so you're just going to leave it there? What were you going to say? I, it already, you already talked about what I was going to say. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a flexible tool, but it, it's, it's so beneficial because, like, again, it, it's like a, it's a real-world simulation type thing um, where you're putting these people in, the, in these situations that are going to happen. But as I kind of tried to allude to a little earlier, right, it's the title of your book, I Need to Effing Talk to You. Right. Because there's a lot of avoidance in these situations, too. We've kind of talked a little bit about like, yeah, the disgruntled customer coming at you, um, you know, and like, oh, how am I going to handle this? How am I going to, you know, uh, put out this fire? Um, but from the internal side. Right. And we talked about uh, uh, there are a whole bunch of great stories. I definitely want you guys to get into um, that you you're it's an internal thing and you keep on passing the buck right where you know like say you have an employee that's just not working out right and you're like well we're just going to move them to this department and we're all moving to this department and you're avoiding tackling the actual situation which whether that's because he's you know he's not a team player or or whatever that might be whatever that situation is you 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 start to pass them around and um but that that's, of course, is not a very effective way of getting it done. It just pushes down the conversation that you eventually need to have months down the road, maybe only weeks down the road um, until something comes to a head. Uh, absolutely. And one of the things that I've, uh, I talk a lot about in the beginning is about uh, whether it's to do with – uh, particularly on the internal employee and manager or coworker and coworker, is the importance of taking early proactive action. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're not going to do something about it, it's because you've made a strategic decision not to tackle it at that point for a justified reason. Not, I just don't know what to do, so I'm not going to do it. Because <laughs> often when we ask people, you know, how many managers in the room, how many people have inherited a, a difficult problem mm-hmm. from someone else? I mean, typically, Ken, what, you know, virtually... 80% of the hands go up in the room because as managers, and if, if you've been in a supervisory position, you've probably found the same, they get moved around the organization. So people, they're not quite bad. You know, the, the individual's performance or attendance or behavior is not quite bad enough to fire them, but not right. good enough for them to have good um uh, effective work so they just move them from one department to another putting off the inevitable and the problem mm. with that is is not only the impact it has on for the manager the impact it has on the team because everybody in the team knows that that individual's not performing and they're right. looking at their boss thinking why are you not dealing with this but it's not being dealt with and the other point is through to 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 the I mean, manager when they go well yeah we don't want to um yeah like this is yeah are you doing a person any favors and right. they sort of look by the sort of non-plus sometimes, and they say, so let's get this scenario. We're sitting there, the, the four of us on this call. Mm-hmm. Okay, Let's say that I'm not performing particularly well in my job. The three mm-hmm. of you all know this. You talk about me when I'm not here, but none right. of you wants to actually tell me, hey, Russ, I, I think you could be a bit better in this area. Right. No one says anything. So we're sort of letting people not succeed, continue – being less than less than effective because we don't want to potentially upset them, so we don't say anything to them. And then when right. they do find out, I've, you know, people have told them, well, "Why did no one say this? How long has this been going on?" Well, it's right. been like this for a couple of years, really, and that's really why you got moved right. from the last two teams. And, and right. why would anyone want to be in that position? And when you look at it for yourself, you'd say, "No, I'd rather somebody told me." 
you know, constructively, but told me what the problem was and could help right. me overcome it. So they weren't doing the individual any favours by not dealing with the issue. And I think that's one of the key things that we wanted to get across to people. Yeah, absolutely. I remember there was an occasion when we, we did a workshop for uh, about 80 uh, members of a construction company. So these were supervisors who themselves would supervise a foreman who were supervising the road crew, right? So you have to have your, they, these are individuals who have to have a difficult conversation with uh, uh, another person beneath them who's also a supervisor, but we're talking hard hats and, and work boots, right? Right. And so we're in this room with like 80 people and we're doing this conversation at the front of the room and there's, uh, and you know, it kind of gets to like a, a difficult place. We call time out and Russell does the, um, the, the spiel that you just heard about, hey, we're not doing anybody any, any like, hey, doing anybody any favors here and i i think we we ended up throwing it back to the room in the sense of like like how dare you how dare you treat your fellow workers disrespect right. because you don't have the balls to tell them that they're not doing a good enough job right like why don't you people just man up <laughs> and hear like a pin drop in the room when right. they realize that oh right this behavior that i'm doing isn't just about uh, me or about them. That it's it's really just it's not it's not just about the company. I'm not doing the foreman any favors. I am inhibiting their career. And yeah. this person has a family. They have children. They and you're letting them jeopardize their future employment right. because you don't want to have that conversation. Way to go, man. Way to go. Yeah. And, and just on the, to follow on the interesting point, at that point, as you say, Kenson, it was like silent. You think, well, this is going to go one or two ways with these folks. And then someone went, oh, well, if you put it like that, they just came straight up to the front and said, they go, hey, look. And they went straight into it. They, they tied into some of the things that we were talking about in here and saying, look, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm not doing this because I'm an arsehole. I'm doing it because, you know, the, this is important and this affects you for your career. And they laid out for why they're having it. You know, the conversation was, was great and the, the actor sort of, yeah, the, <laughs> this is exactly what I want him to do. And then you could see, look around the room and people were like, oh, okay, yeah, I see why I need to do this now. Yeah, and it less yeah. became, a, oh, well, it's a it's a management thing, check in the box. And like, oh, yeah, yeah, because most of the people that we got in my team are, 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 you know, are good people, you know. There's not, right. They're not bad people. There's just that on occasion they need to, you know, whether they need a bit of support or they need a bit of a prod to, to do something. And, yeah. okay, now I see why I'm doing it. And it would completely change it, I think, for a lot of them. And, and, but that just changed oh, yeah. their mindset. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that kind of goes down to, like, the actual reality of how often do you actually have to do those conversations and you know there's that fear of not knowing how to do it and i think that's the main reason why those things get avoided it's not because one person is a is like a, a bad person or a bad manager it's just like you know as humans we don't like having those kind of conversations because we know they're going to be hard but the more you practice something the more you actually have real life experience doing it the better you're at with it and the better you can communicate just ultimately it's, I mean, like they, like you guys had told them, it, it doesn't do the person who's not performing any favors by you not having that conversation. Yeah. So it's better to just, you know, and I don't think that any of those people would ever be able to have that conversation without being in that kind of place where they can actually do that with a real actor who's really like involved with it to give them that um, simulation feeling that it's actually happening. Yeah. And if you, and once again, like we're talking about how we, you know, you talk behind your back with somebody about they're not performing well enough. The longer you allow that to fester, the more it feels like there's no way we're going to be able to get this right. Right. It's like, oh, they'll never do it. Even though you never even talked to them. You didn't even ask. You didn't even try. You know, it festers, it festers and it gets so, now I was going to say frothy, but you know, like, and then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, well, this person just has to go. Like, there's no way we can't talk to them. Um, and you know what? Now I'm starting to realize that there, there was a couple situations that we were in that maybe had we, instead of avoiding the conversation and talking about it behind back and been like, listen, if you don't start to do this, then we have to let you go. Rather than just getting it to a point where we made a decision internally that we can't, we have to cut off this person. We could have done a little bit more, like I said, and just been like, hey, man, I need to have to talk to you because this is just not working out. This, what you're doing right now isn't going to, it's not going to happen in the future. Now, whether or not that's you taking the steps, 
and us working together to fix the problem or if that's just, you know what, I just don't want to do it. Because like I said, it, it's there are people out there, you like these people for the most part, maybe you have some weird things that you don't like about them, right? But for the most part, they're generally good people. They have families, they have career aspirations. Maybe they really don't want to be in that. It, it doesn't matter what the situation is. You owe it to them to at least give the try to help them fix it and and this is exactly what the simul what what you guys are doing with form theater that's exactly what that's allowing these people to do and it's allowing them to um it's allowing them to have the tools and have the experience without actually having to have experienced the bad yeah, right <laughs> right and, in real and, life yeah and it goes to to note too that the people that are acting uh, that are underperforming if, if no one tells them they're underperforming, they might like know that they're underperforming, but they might also be like, well, I might be underperforming, but it doesn't seem like it's that big of an issue. <laughs> like, you know, I'm just going to different teams. Like, you know, every, yeah. every year they're sending me to a different project. I'm like, oh, maybe I'm just better suited for that project. You know, yeah. I don't know. Right. And exactly. I'm so good that this right. other team wants me. Yeah, <laughs> <So right. badly. laughs> they, Yeah, they called in the special request and everything. Because um, uh, I, I just calm everything down. I slow everybody down. I just right. reduce the pace so that everybody has a more relaxing work-life yeah. balance by just kicking back, yeah. easing off. That's what right. I contribute to a team. Yeah, exactly. No, that's not what you do. <laughs> this whole idea of not of – not going and, and talking to people because you're avoiding the situation and how you guys really do help through simulation, life simulation with the actors and the uh, forum theater, um, help put people in those situations, um, very lifelike simulations to then go and tackle those situations. And I wanted you guys to tell the story about the, the police. Um, the, the, it was something to do with the police where the guy got arrested, um, where that was a really good example of that um of that whole thing about the internal about how people were just moving somebody around um and that didn't resolve the problem and then at the end of the simulation it ended up that uh russell got arrested and, and, and tossed out <laughs> because he was just being a problem a problem for everybody yeah so so um I just to explain back, sort of if we just backtrack slightly as Ken was describing the forum forum theater approach one of the ways that we tend to set up the scenario is that if you imagine that uh, people are in like a cabaret style uh, spread around the room in our pre-covid days um, mm. with the scenario they're workshopping how they would tackle it we tend to start the action with the actor and and me typically as as the uh, employee in this case it was a customer service uh, focused workshop so the actor was a was going to play various customers that the um, municipality here in southern alberta had um, i was going to be the employee um to, to, to sort of start each scenario off so uh, the idea with that is that i'm always incredibly bad in in my um representation at the, at the beginning so if, if in this situation you know i was doing all the things you would not want an employee to deal to do when they're dealing with a disgruntled customer uh ken tends to stop the action after a couple of minutes um there's a fair amount of laughter around the room of what's going on and says you know what is russ doing wrong and of course people can come up with a whole list of things that i haven't done i haven't done well then he asks them to think about what they would do if they were in that position. They come up with some solutions, and that's when we get the, the forum really starting to um, take somebody out and then bring them, uh, say, okay, that's great. Jack, why don't you swap over from Russ and, and you come in and take it of how you would deal with it? And that's how we get into the, the interactive part. Two reasons for doing that. One is that the um, – the bar, bar's set pretty low. Then they're, they're never going to be uh, worse than bad Russell, as we say. <laughs> and secondly, um, that the joke is always on me. It's never on the participant. So any mm. of the humour that we use, and we use a fair bit of appropriate humour, but it's always it comes from the actor about them, or it was about me. It's never about the joke's never on the participant. Right. So what had happened here is we had a series of, of uh, what originally weren't designed to be interlinked scenarios, but we sort of the theme came in is that each time we were dealing with um, different departments of the municipality. So in each scenario, what we sort of got into the habit was that, that bad Russell had been moved from one part of the organisation to the other. Nobody dealt with the situation and he was just getting in further and further away from customer interaction. 
um, alluding to what you said earlier, where people just move the problem around the organization and, and deal with it. Okay. Right. Um, so we'd got to this sort of afternoon. I think we were on scenario four or something. Um, and in this scenario, you know, we were, I can't remember, we were at the rec center and something was supposed to be happening here at the recreation center um, about a booking. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Ken set it up with the point of, well, Russ, as you remember from the morning scenarios, had been moved to this back office job way, way away from any. But as chance would have it, you know. Uh, 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 Raj, who's on the front desk, is at lunch, and a customer's come in, and guess who happens to be the only person who sees them out the corner of his eye and decides to come to the front desk? Well, it's the bad Russell character. So we started right. going through this, and of course, I was you know doing it terribly as 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 designed, and. Part of our group, because they're a fairly disparate group, we had people from Parks and Recreation, and people from headquarters, and people from the. Um, you know, refuse collection, but we also had a couple of peace officers um, who were sort of a some other sort of semi police um, at a local municipal level. Okay, so what ended up happening is the, so the scenario unfolding showed the beauty of improvisation. Is Ken was running with this as it came up because it came up well. We need to get a supervisor involved. So then we got another person. Okay, you need to come up. We're keeping Russ in the action, but we now need a supervisor, and we need somebody else who's going to be um, from Parks and Recreation who, yeah, you were doing the pool maintenance, but now you come in and you're going to have to deal with the... the, the so now they were dealing with it as well. Then the group said, what, what's next? And, of course, I kept interjecting with these unhelpful things. I said, get one of the police officers, let's get this guy out of here. So we ended up with, I think it was four people on the stage, including the actor, a, a peace officer who's now handcuffed me, taking me off of the of the stage to be taken off somewhere else. Um, and they even got to the point, I think they'd led me out the building or something like this, that we, I, was out, I was out by their cruiser and, uh, you know, he was threatening that if I didn't improve my behaviour, as bad <laughs> Russ, and they'd actually put me in the cruiser and take me away. But it's a, uh, it, it was uh, two things. One, it was interesting to see how you could evolve that whole improvisation and run with the scenario as it was naturally unfolding. So although we yeah. have um, an outline, it's not scripted, and you know you'll know from your your work. So it allows the latitude that if something interesting is happening, we can play on that and do more of it. We don't have yeah. to say, oh, sorry, no, no, that isn't in here. We have to stop. And it yeah. allowed the group to have some fun with it because by this time they were getting quite relaxed with the approach. Um, mm-hmm. We're enjoying it. And, you know, they were throwing a couple of other things in there that we hadn't even planned, but we could just roll with and the actor would just do. So, you know, it ended up getting the learning across um, showing how this situation could develop, but also they had some fun with it as well, and it was, uh, you know, it, it ended up being quite an amusing thing that people remembered because when their um, the HR manager came in later on, they were like, "I heard all this laughter from this." I mean, we don't tend to have people laughing at these customer service works. You know, like, oh, well, well uh, that could be because we're not doing death by PowerPoint. So um, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> there we there we are. Yeah. I think uh, I remember we went back to that same city about a year later and we had at least two participants who were who showed up again. And I was like, I remember you. I recognize you. Why are you here? And they're like, oh, yeah, it was so much fun last year. I came and I brought a friend and there was uh, somebody else from their from their department who uh, right. to participate in it. And I, th- I think it was one of the police officers. It was also somebody yep. who came back. He, he, he came back with a couple of his colleagues and one of the guys from Parks and Recreation bought his whole team. Because he said, look, we have to do a mandatory um, you know, training every year. And if we're going to have to do something, this was actually, this was actually good. I, we, I enjoyed this and right. I learned something from it. So why don't we get you all to come to this? So there were about six of them of his team that came with him the second yeah. year round. And I said, well, you didn't have to come yourself. He goes, yeah, but I enjoyed it. It was a good thing. <laughs> I wanted to come yeah, again. Right, so, right. You know, and, and as Ken and I have always said, he said, there's nothing wrong with people enjoying their learning. And having right. some fun yeah. with it. It yeah. doesn't have to be this sort of very serious, you know, sit there and it's all sort of doom and gloom. Um, yeah. With with and certainly what they'd experienced before was that sort of, you know, thou shalt not do these things when dealing with a customer. Thou shalt do these things, you know, sort of Ten Commandments approach. We can have some fun with it and still have a serious message uh, that people will understand and take away and be able to apply. So, uh, you know, that, 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 that story was a good example of that. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I've ran into this, you know, I've had a couple of jobs where, you know, sometimes they do that whole shadowing thing where, you know, you're shadowing this one person and that one person basically 
uh, does not let you do anything. They just tell you what they're going to do. And you're just, you're like, you're like, look at, and you know, it could be two weeks. It could be like uh, two days or sometimes it's only a day. You shadow someone and you're supposed to learn everything about everything in those, in that one day. And it's like, well, you know, you actually have to do the job to figure out what you're supposed to do in it, you know? And like the shadow and while it's all right, I don't really get any tangible information. And half the information I get is like you said, death by PowerPoint, you lose it all because you haven't really done it, you know? And once you actually do it, that's when you start to learn how to do it. And that's exactly why I think this approach of actually experiential learning actually helps people think, oh, you know, now I have something to say and my input in this um, particular teaching method actually works. Whereas if it's just PowerPoint and you ask a question about it, it's like, no, well, that's on the PowerPoint. So whatever you're, you know, like, thanks for your opinion, but I'm not going to change the PowerPoint. The situation isn't going to change because of your input. We have to get to the next slide. Well, one, one thing that we definitely know about, um, especially with attention building, which you guys are very much in that, you have to build the attention of this group and get them participating as you include them in the thing that you're doing, right? And their opinions. And so when you took it on, okay, well, Bad Russ is just moving back and forth from these different departments. It was all of a sudden they were a part of this story and it was unique and they had just as much control over it as you did, right? And that, I mean, we, we try to get people to understand that about branding and marketing all the time. And it's like, you have to include your audience because once again, it's not, you, you said this earlier, Ken, it's like um, when, when that gentleman in Brazil was doing this, it was very much a one-way conversation. But what you guys have done and what Forum Theater has done is made it a two-way conversation, which is exa exactly what social media has done on the marketing branding side is made it a two-way conversation. So not only can I, I – I can't just rely on me saying my message. I also have to include the audience in what they're saying back to me, um, which, I mean, I it sounds like fun just doing that. Like I'd want to yeah. be in that room with the whole situation where the police officers take Russell outside, you know, and, because – it's enjoyable and there's nothing wrong with it being enjoyable. Actually, it should be. And all trainings really should. They should hire you guys. And you yeah. know what? As soon as I find, yeah. you know, when I hear all training, all training <laughs> all the time, everyone should hire us guys. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. That, that's the segment you just need to keep, you keep in. Yeah, if right, everything else yeah. gets cut, that's there the one that you need to keep in. Yeah, yeah. yeah there you and go. And they should also buy their book. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> which is a good which is a good, uh, a good segue into the book, I Need Effing Talk to You, which is essentially the, the approach that you guys have with a lot of the stuff, simplified, of course, um, but put into a, 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 a very easily digestible uh, format. And then, of course, Russell has the book. He could go ahead and show on the screen here if you're listening to this you're missing out because it's a beautiful book it's red and it's got you know instead of instead of of course having the word on there you know they have a crossed out and a brilliant oh, picture that you could see yeah, right. on the, of both of them of both brilliant, of them. brilliant picture of both of them Look yeah but let, let's talk a little bit more about the book and the advantages um and while well, we know the reason why you guys wrote the book is and anybody write the book i said nobody's effing talking about this um you know and and this is something that needs to needs to be a little bit more in the in the um like weapon that. holster for hr you know like this is something that that that's out there that's available that people should be utilizing yeah, you know it's interesting too. The um, did, you kind of described it that the book doesn't go uh, into as much detail, but in fact it actually does. It goes into more detail than mm -hmm. we're often able to get into in the session, because in any of those sessions, while we cover the same material and we sometimes cover um, various things, because we we often build these workshops in a modular format. So depending on what it is the client wants to address, we can drill down into one subject or another. But in and but you can only cover so much in a four right. hour workshop or three hour workshop however much time they give us. But in the book, you can we can just keep drilling down into all of these various and different subjects. So in the book, but the drawback is that the book is just like what you described, any kind of a book is a one-way flow of information. Yeah. Right? It's coming from the author to you, the reader, in a printed in a printed format, and and you're receiving. Right. Right. So which really runs counter to the program that we've described to you. So right. when we set out to write this in a book, we thought really long and hard about how can we make the book as interactive as possible? 
Mm-hmm. So the f- the first thing we did was that we included in the book a lot of the scenarios that we would use in the workshops. And we kind of took the accumulated wisdom of the six or seven years that we've been running these workshops so that each of the scenarios kind of uh, um, uh, bring it, ties a lot of those things together. So that just like in the workshop, you're able to receive the input by reading like, you know, kind of the model as, uh, as, as in the workshop Russell would describe, but in the, in the book, it's kind of laid out for you. And then we've got a, a dialogue. A scenario a scene it's written just as as if it was a screenplay right where you know just um, right. you've got kind of written as dialogue and with stage directions and then at the end of that to so, so you're in this sense you're able to watch those models being put into action right right and we even go so far as to have a bad russ version where you get mm-hmm. to see the character doing it poorly and then we come we come back and we also wanted a little bit more of that interaction so there's a bit of a worksheet so mm-hmm. you, as the reader, get to rate, how did that manager do? Well, they did it poorly. And how did they, uh, what, what, what would you see that they could improve upon? Yeah. And we give them kind of another piece of model. And then we, then we, we, we rewrite that same scenario where it's the exact same circumstances. It starts in exactly the same place, but now the character applies the model. So you get to see that being successful. And then again, there's a worksheet at the end. Did you see the model in action? Where, go back, draw a line across where they move from phase one to phase two, et cetera. Yeah. So the, so the book itself becomes less of a one-way flow of information and more of a workbook. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, and that does, it does help because, you know, I, I, I and oddly enough, I'm struck by a, a quote um, from, uh, from Matt Elwell's stepfather. Do you remember that? that all models are bad, but some are useful. Oh. Um, and he said that on the podcast when, when we had him on the podcast, which we found out yesterday was very early on. He's like yeah, number right. like yeah, 13. Number, number 14. Yeah, this yeah. To, uh, to qualify, I think you guys are going to be number 54. So yeah. it was a while back. We've known him for a good chunk of time now. And um, But that's what he, he said his stepfather used to always say. And what he meant by that was is that, you know, this book is, is a good uh, – example of what could happen right but you can only explain so much in the book right it, it, it is very much no matter how much you try to make it a two-way conversation you start talking to this book you're going to be put into a you know an insane asylum so you, you only have that one route of, of communication so it's a good it's a good way to introduce somebody to this concept right and even for them to go out and try to implement some of this stuff but at the end of the day too they're going to run into issues that only you two guys could really solve, right? Where they go like, hey, I want to do this on a much bigger scale, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, I can't do this, but I know that if I call these guys, they're going to be able to do it um, in that way. But like to your point, you could get really down into a lot of the details and exactly what you're thinking and exactly what, you know, what the goal of these exercises are, which gives a good starting point, especially um, for some of these people that, once again, may not know about form theater. That may, you know, think that the PowerPoint is is you know God. That's that's the way that you know. can get you can get information out to people. I don't know of anyone who thinks PowerPoint is God. Well, why are they continually using it then? I, I don't know. Anyways, just lazy. Anyways, but that that's just my thought on that. But it, it's 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 important, and I you know I, I definitely urge everybody to go out and buy the book and give it a try yourself. And then if you can't figure it out, you know. These guys are up in Canada. They're going to cost a lot of money to fly them down to, you know, wherever we are. But definitely, definitely give them a give them a call. Well, you know, one of the ways we tried to approach it, too, is we tried to think of the book not as we tried to think of the book as part of an ecosystem. Yeah, so it was the book. And then we we in in following your footsteps, we launched a podcast in January called the I Need to Effing Talk to You podcast. Yeah. And coming up very soon is the I Need to Effing Talk to You online course. And then the and then in the as we get further into the spring, we also want to be launching the I need to epic talk to you online interactive masterclasses where you can come and actually practice with mm. the live actor over Zoom. Oh. And then, of course, there's the ultimate, the pinnacle, the peak of the pyramid is the uh, the opportunity to either uh, hire us to co- either come down in person or during these pandemic times to be able to do it remotely. Right, right, right. Right. And so that's we, a sort of sorry, that's a sort of post-COVID 
uh, celebration for people. So when they've said, look, we've had no chance to have any interaction with people, we say, yeah. well, why not hire us? And you can come here with one of, with one of our actors, locally sourced, because the other thing, just to bear in mind, that, that we'll sure. be, wherever, whichever city we go to, we always look to hire an actor from that city. So we're looking to yeah. hire some of the local talent. Um, and, and then people can come and have that as their celebration. We can actually come together and we can do a workshop. And it's not, let's come together for the first time in 18 months and I'm going to show you a PowerPoint for an hour. Um, yeah, let's right. let's come and do something yeah, like this. Right. Um, so there was there was a couple of things with the with the book that we were sort of worth mentioning. I think in terms of Ken's part of the ecosystem, we wanted it to be like an introduction for people. So that if you were thinking, I need to be, I want to be better at doing this, the sure. book gives you a starting point for that. With the view that ultimately people could say, well, now I need to actually physically do it. I've done some preparation. Now I can have one of those you know, live face to face or a live online. Um, interaction with an actor so I can practice doing it. The other thing was for pe- the other end for people who'd been on one of our programs, rather than that bit where you get given the handouts, you know, mm. here is a copy of the models, here's the copy of the stuff that's in here, and they sort of go into a folder and they get a bit dog eared and then they get put away. You can have the book where the models we've talked about and the process we've discussed is in the book with the scenarios, as Ken has said, so you can take back and revisit it. And it's as if you're revisiting some of the work you've done yeah. on, on, on the workshop as, as well. And, and one thing I must say on, on, on the book point is that great kudos to Ken for this. Ken, Ken was the, the driving force on the actual writing. His penmanship um, with his background as a, as a playwright was invaluable. I mean, I, yeah. I don't know whether we'd have ever got to that if, if we hadn't got Ken's work on there. And, yeah. and the style that he put in it was very much, we wanted it to be um, like we aimed it at the audience of our construction supervisors. That was the mm. audience we were looking at. We wanted it to be for the, the, the average, um, and, and with no disrespect intended, but the person right. who's the average supervisor that you have out there who's not looking for a PhD level drive down into an academic text. They want mm. something that they can open, they can read, perhaps when they're in their you know truck at lunch, when they're on their way to the job site, if they're in the break room at, at the store, they can go and have a quick look at and then be able to apply. And it was well yeah. in that language that it was easily accessible for people. So it wasn't just, you know, well, you're going to need to have at least an MBA before you can get into the introduction <laughs> of this book. That's not what yeah. we wanted. It wanted it open to anybody who was going to need to use it um and a testament to ken's um skill as penmanship that he that, it, that that's how it's come across eh? yeah i i want because <laughs> i you. i i want to congratulate you guys at discovering and understanding something that not many yeah. brands really understand you mentioned the word ecosystem we call it a story world Which, and the business side usually call it an ecosystem on an entertainment in an ecosystem on the business side. Now, um, that's like three people that have... Yeah, right. So now when we're talking it on the business side, we know we're going to call it an ecosystem. On the entertainment side, it's called story world, right? But what you guys have managed to do is you're understanding not only different levels of attention, but you're understanding too that you need to progress people through an attention type model where you're taking somebody... So say they, they went to one of the courts, they experienced it, right? And they're like, you know what? I want to implement this. They go off and you know people change careers all the time. They go off and they're like, you know what? I can get the book. And I could start to, you know, piece some stuff together and maybe do this myself. Not only that, they don't stop there, folks. And you know how excited I am about this if you're a frequent listener of the podcast. They have decided that now they're going to have a podcast in which they can express some of these things that are going on in the book that they're experiencing in real life, talking to people and going out and actually talking about these different things so that can actually implement it. But not only that, they're not even going to stop there. No, now we're going to offer an online class where you, the person, you have the book and you're like, you know what? I feel like I just need a little bit more. Let me do a little bit more. Let me learn a little bit more. Let me have a little bit of live interaction, whether that's through Zoom or or whether that's them watching a video on it, right? And they're going to get to know this system even further. And then at the pinnacle, at the end of this attention journey is, do you want us to come and do it for you? And then you could really experience it again. Done. That's it. You guys figured it out. Congratulations. Because that's the, this is what we're trying to get people to understand about branding and marketing, right? Is you're trying to create content that not only 
gets somebody's attention, but holds it. And then over a long period of time, builds that trust over, over, over again. Um, and you guys, it, it's not, it's not a pitch. You guys are showing how it works. You're inviting people in. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Absolutely fantastic. My hat's off to you. If I had a hat on, I would have taken it off. <laughs> you know, Frank, that's, there, that's really great. And there's also another um, phase of this. So I mean, ultimately what you've described is kind of like the funnel shape, right? Where there's, yeah. they come in, they get the book, and then they then they get uh, into another thing and into another thing and another thing. And as, you know, we think of it as a funnel because more people will buy the book. Not everybody will take the online course. Not right. everybody will sign up. For and then fewer people fewer people would have us come into their company. I mean, so, right. so it, it, it narrows. But then there's another kind of below the line pattern that happens is once we've come in and done the workshop, then, you know, there's the one person who's brought us in is the only person who's experienced that ecosystem to that point. That you yeah. Can. So now we're doing the workshop for, let's say it's for like 10, 12 of their, of their supervisors, or maybe it's that larger construction company we've described where there's 60 people in the room. So there's some number of individuals who are now being exposed to these ideas for the first time in the context of the live workshop in the room. But then a you know, wise company then goes away and you know, all of those people are now signed up for the online course. So yeah. that learning can be reinforced in yeah. small bite-sized chunks over the, that they can watch at their own speed, hopefully even at the point where they're like, oh, I got to have that conversation with that effer in the, the, the yeah. that effing person in the next little bit. And so I guess I better get ready. Hey, here, I've got that online course sitting in my inbox that I never bothered to look at. Let's watch it now. It's only, it's only like uh, 20 minutes. And then having watched that, they're like, oh, that's great. And that's right. I've got the book on my shelf. And then they go and they get the book and they can yeah. take it home that night and they can use it to prep. So the, so in a sense, but the funnel that you described is actually an hourglass shape. Where you sure. know they 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 can come in until they experience a live workshop, but then there's all this other ways of reinforcing that learning so yeah. that it doesn't get lost. So yeah. much of I was chatting with a friend yesterday who specializes in online learning and learning, and who reminded me that in an, any online for, learning format, the average user only retains about ten percent sure. of the content. But if you can find other ways to reinforce that learning, and if you can spread that over time then that percentage uh, rises exponentially. Yeah. And, and you know, the other thing you mentioned about the podcast, I think that also can, that can reach a wider distribution of supervisors. Maybe they have a problem. Maybe they need, want this type of training, but then they're like, hey, you know what? We're doing these type of training. You know, I've been listening to this podcast and, you know, they have this, they have yeah. this, they have the online courses. I think it'd be a really good idea if we did. So you have supervisors talking to their higher ups yeah. to come pull you in yeah. too because you guys are actually producing content that people have, first of all, have value to them and also they like to interact with. That's the ecosystem, right? I don't mm-hmm. care how people get into, you, you call it a funnel. Um, our, our partner, Tom Kennan, hates the word funnel. He thinks it's like such an old school word with with no real strategy behind it. Um, so we call it audience advancement. But I don't care how they get in to whatever train of, of, of the attention. Um, it could come from anywhere. But it's the way that they're going to continue to interact. And, and it's a resource. They have so many resources available to them to constantly, they have no reason to go and shop around. They have the, I need to effing talk to you ecosystem that they can go, no matter what their price point is, to go in and mm-hmm. start getting involved. And so getting information. once again, I don't know if you can hear it in the flexion of my voice, but I that is absolutely amazing that that's the stuff that you guys are doing. It's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I said, if we could just get another handful of people like you to understand um, that that's the way that this is starting to work, that it's social media, it's poor storytelling. So, you know, if you find out from the master class that, you know, they don't like the video, but they want more live action like this type of stuff done. That's what we're going to start offering, you know, and you don't force stuff down people's throats. So mm-hmm. once again, fantastic. And I really wish that we had a little bit more time so we can dive a little <laughs> bit further into that. But I think we did a fantastic job of, of really just. Um, reiterating the fact that if you can do something like this and have a live um, live simulations that actually have different scenarios and that you're pushing people to actually come up and interact with a module to learn um, how beneficial that is, no matter what the problem is, if that's on the customer, uh, customer, um, not customer journey, what is that, customer interaction side, or if that's an internal um, problems, that this is really a great way to go about it. Um, 
So, guys, it's been, once again, a great conversation. We usually end off with some words of wisdom, anything that you think that might summarize the conversation that we had. Um, this time, I'm going to ask you guys to talk through for yourselves. Don't try to speak for the other person of your summary. Uh, but whomever would like to go first. Whenever I'm looking for words of wisdom, I always turn to Russell Stratton. So, Russell, why don't you go first? <laughs> <laughs> okay, th th thanks, Ken. Um, I, I think for me, the final point, we'll be back to the, the idea about simulation. And that's the whole thought of that experiential learning. Um, and it comes back from your point about you have you know, models um, you know, uh, are useful to a degree, but you need to be able to have something that, that, that you can in, in, interact with um, and is flexible. And it comes back to some of my earlier work with some, some a group of former Marines. And it was like, yeah, we can be trained to a certain level of what we should do, once we get the action starts, the plan that we have often is has to change and we need to be able to adapt on the fly and we need to be able to deal with all the emotions that are going through our head if we're under fire, we're, you know, we're pinned down. We can't, we, we can't just, oh, well, the model says X and now we can't improvise. So that idea that you would be able to, you know, you've had that experience in your training that you know how to improvise, you know, not the, the phrase that they would perhaps use, but improvise, on the fly to be able to achieve a result is really in a corporate sense what we're looking to do for people here. It's not yeah. always going to go to the plan that you had on your piece of paper when you bring somebody in to have a chat with them, but can you adapt as you go and you've had the experience of doing that in our workshop and therefore you are able to get that successful result at the end. You're not like, yeah. oh, well, that's not all I was expecting, therefore it's all over. Um, right. You're able to work with it and that's what we're trying to do. Excellent. Um, I think my piece of wisdom is the I I found that I've I've sat through so many either workshops or learning opportunities or lectures or conferences that consist of one or three or five people on a panel uh, pontificating, lecturing, sharing with a room full of people in which the collective wisdom of the room far exceeds that of the person or people on the stage. Yeah. And it's my belief that there is a far greater wisdom in the group than there is in any one individual. And having yeah. sat through so many of those kinds of learning opportunities or workshops or conference experiences, it's it's my fervent hope that no one should suffer as I have suffered. <laughs> right. And instead, gotcha. we want to offer a kind of interactive learning experience that really draws on that wisdom of the room so that you as the learner are participating, you're learning, you're sharing what you know, and you're soaking up what everybody else knows. And that instead of people leaning back with their arms crossed and absorbing 10 percent of, of what's being said, they're leaning forward, they're engaged, they're, they're talking and, and throwing new ideas into the forum, and they're retaining... 75 80 90 percent of what's being yeah said. yeah yeah absolutely i, I do agree Love with that. you ken I, I do dislike panels yeah right well yeah panels yeah you rarely I, ever do you get anything out of those you either really don't nor, most of the time they're just saying about stuff and then you're like well how'd you how'd you get to that other point like, uh -huh. i'm not gonna talk about that stuff. <laughs> like i'm gonna talk about what i'm doing now it's like well how'd that help me but yeah but yeah so uh, great points guys it's so great that we got you on the podcast um, there's so much value in this conversation. Um, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for inviting thanks for us. It's been me. great. Thanks for having us. Well, what another great conversation. I mean, forum theater really is like the new wave of training. And I don't, I, I, yeah. if anybody goes back to power PowerPoint, I mean, yeah, that's crazy. The, the power of PowerPoint is, is, is just boring. I mean, yeah. if I don't know any, every, I don't even understand how people, People who've done training, people, everyone's done some sort of training. They realize that they that you know it goes in one ear, goes out the other. But if right. you're actually invested in the situation and you're in a simulation, you can have a lot of fun and you'll retain a lot of information. Hopefully, instead of only ten percent, you get ninety percent, like Ken said. Right. Exactly. Um, if you want some more fantastic conversations, you can check them out to my this side and <laughs> and also you can watch a new episode of Simulations. Yeah, which is coming out this Friday, guys. So enjoy, and uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.